I'm Arva. I'm Gracie. And I'm Yaritza. And you're watching SLPs in a Podcast, episode four. Yay! We have some special guests today. We have Jessica and Audra on here for Praxis Trivia Night. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Hi. Can you tell us about yourselves a little bit? Sure. I'm Jess. Um, I'm from New Jersey. Uh, I have not signed up or have not taken the Praxis yet. I am a second year student going into my second year of graduate school. Um, and my interests are pediatric dysphagia, specifically um, going into the NICU. I'd really like to work in there and learn more about like infants, like birth to one, that age timeline. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. How about you, Audra? Yeah, my name is Audra, and I, like Jess, I'm also a second year um, speech language pathology student. Um, I'm really interested in pediatric dysphagia as well, um, specifically behavioral feeding. And I have also not signed up for the practice yet, but I am looking to get some exposure <laughs> early practice. Came to the right place for that. <laughs> okay, That's what we're here for. All right. Should we go over the rules? Yes. <laughs> 20 questions, all pertaining to the scopes of our field, which if you don't know is speech language pathology, as well as questions pertaining to audiology. Um, you two will be given 30 seconds after each question to read and submit an answer. Um, you may choose to pass a question. We put this in because it may pertain to a course of study that you haven't taken yet. And that's not really fair. So if you don't know the subject or it's a little confusing you, Feel free to pass the question. You won't gain any points. You won't lose any points. Um, if you get a question right, plus two. If you get a question wrong, only minus one because we're all learning here. Um, <laughs> and then whoever has the most points will be the winner. But aren't we all winners because we learned a little something at the end of the day? All right. Areas covered by the praxis are broken down into the following categories, foundations and professional practice. There's also screening, assessment, evaluation, and diagnosis. And finally, planning, implementation, and evaluation of treatment. So it covers the following areas of study. Um, I'm just going to name a few, like speech sound production, fluency, hearing and oral re rehabilitation, communication impairments related to cognition. The questions came from the study resource and advanced review of speech language pathology. We did not create these questions, nor did we include any questions we saw on our actual practice exam since uh, Gracie, Arv, and I did already take it. Question one. So, um, Yadi, if you want to start the timer for 30 seconds. Question one. In a comprehensive oral examination for the master's degree, a faculty member describes a 40-year-old woman who talks to herself, uses confused language, although the speech is mostly grammatical, and describes events and experiences that may be unreal. The student is asked to diagnose the communication problem of the woman described. Which of the following is the correct answer? A, global aphasia, B, Wernicke's aphasia, C, schizophrenia, or D, apraxia of speech? We got takers for B, Wernicke's aphasia. Mine backwards. Two, two takers for B? <laughs> Audrey, yours is backwards. <laughs> I flipped it. <laughs> okay. The answer is actually C, schizophrenia. So the key words here for you guys are A, she talks to herself and uses confused language, which, yes, sounded very much like Wernicke's. However, the speech is mostly grammatical. Um, and she also describes events and experiences that may be unreal, all things that um, are key signs of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. However, yes, you're right. The second closest answer when you're given these phrases do point to Wernicke's aphasia, but the key there was that it was mostly grammatical. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in our field of speech language pathology, would we be asked to diagnose schizophrenia or is that out of our scope of practice? It's out of our and, practice, but we can refer for a psyche eval if we feel that it's leading towards something more psychological rather than like a language component. It's all about finding the phrases, mm -hmm. those key words in there, because they're just giving you symptoms to something and hoping you know the definition. But really, um, this isn't something we come as much 
in contact with in therapy, but maybe something you run into in your career. So it's nice to know. That was a good question though. Yes. Question two, a researcher teaches a new book reading program to caregivers of children on the autism spectrum and evaluates the children's literacy skills one year later. The researcher's goal is to evaluate whether or not there is a relationship between caregivers implementation of the program and children's literacy skills. The researcher finds that there is an R level uh, equal to 0.15 correlational relationship between caregivers reported implementation of the program and children's literacy skills. The researcher can safely conclude that A, there is a strong positive correlation, B, there is a strong negative correlation, C, there is no significant relationship, or D, there's a mildly significant cause-effect relationship between those two. All right. We got two answers? Did, uh, sorry. no, wait, hold on. Audra hasn't yet. Oh, a. Sorry. All right, so we have D and A. The answer is actually C. <laughs> <laughs> there is no significant relationship between the caregivers um, and the program. The caregivers program and the literacy skills, sorry. So um, R equals 0.5 correlational relationship is not statistically significant. That's that's it. So really, something I definitely noticed in this question, um, as well as you will notice in many of the questions, is that the beginning is a lot of long-winded background when really all you needed was the question. So a tip that I learned while studying, read the last sentence first, which is the question, and go back and read the whole thing. So Arv is going to read the whole thing for you, obviously, for, for flow's sake. But um, <laughs> when you are reviewing, trying to pick your answer, sometimes it's helpful just to see what they want, especially when you're on the actual practice and it's time sensitive. Um, just knowing what the question is asking for when you're sorting through all of those key words that you're trying to find, it keeps you in a better headspace and less likely to get confused by what they're trying to trick you up with. Question three, Clyde, a 72-year-old man with Parkinson's disease, has a reduced range of movement of his upper limbs due to rigidity. How will his reduced range of movement affect the size of the selection display of an augmentative and alternative communication device? A, the size of the selection display will be increased. B, it'll have to be reduced. C, it will have to stay the same. Or D, the size will not be impacted because this individual does not qualify for an AAC. Audra has her answer in, and Jess is hers. All right. B, the size of the selection display will need to be reduced. So um, if I can, I'm going to go back to the question real quick. So he has a reduced range of motion. So if you think about the size of the display, yes, I guess when we think about um, elderly people, and it's nice to have things that are a little bit bigger, easier to see. Um, but also, in this case, um, he, his movements are so small and short because of the Parkinson's, the further apart you put them and the larger they are, the harder it'll be for him. So that is why they need to be reduced in the case of a Parkinson's patient. Okay, question four. Question four. A 60-year-old patient fell and hit his head on a bathtub, sustaining a traumatic brain injury. You have physician orders to evaluate his responsiveness and communication. When you screen this patient, he is generally unresponsive to verbal or tactile stimuli. The following assessments may be an appropriate choice for a full evaluation of this patient, except A, the Galveston orientation and amnesia test, the Rancho Los Amigos levels of cognitive function, the Glasgow Com Coma Scale, or the Disability Rating Scale. So your keyword is except for this one. That's what I was going to say. Oops, sorry. <laughs> You were right the other way. <laughs> the answer is actually A. The Galvanization Amnesia Test. Amnesia Test. I can't talk at all. <laughs> Remember, this is all just for practice. Um, so the key words in this question was that it was an appropriate choice for a full evaluation. So let me just go back. The Galveston um, Orientation Test is the only one here not used for eval. Rancho. Glasgow and the disability rating scales can all be used in an evaluation. The Galveston orientation and amnesia test, also known as the GOAT, is used for um, evaluating recovery. It's not a full evaluation at the initial onset, but trying to see the stages of recovery 
in a closed head injury. Question five, you are screening the speech of a third grade Spanish speaking student named Araceli. Which of the following would not be typical for Araceli based on the influence of her primary language of Spanish? A, my sister Yuli is coming. B, I like Barry, much my teacher. C, my mom and me be going shopping later. Or D, my friends always say hello to me. Audra. There you go. All right. They both pick C. Oh. Ding, ding, ding. The answer choice C is not Spanish vernacular. It is the African-American English vernacular because of the habitual B. My mommy and me be going shopping later is unique to the African-American English vernacular. All right, question six. You have been asked to counsel with John, a 70-year-old man who has smoked and drank alcohol since he was a teenager. He now has laryngeal cancer, and before surgery, the surgeon asked you to talk with John about esophageal speech. You explained to John that there are two basic types of esophageal speech. In one method, the patient is taught to keep the esophagus open and relaxed while inhaling rapidly. In the other method, the patient impounds the air in the oral cavity, pushes it back into the esophagus, and it vibrates the cricopharyngeus muscle. What is the second method called? Is it A, inhalation method? B, laryngeal airway resistance method, C, inhal inhalatory, inhalatory injection method, or D, injection method. Answers? Oh, it's B. B? I was going to say B. All right, let's I see. I have no idea, though. D, the injection method. So, um, of the options that were given, the inhalation method and the injection method are forms of esophageal speech who are used for people who have undergone a laryngectomy. For the inhalation method, which was the first one mentioned in the question, the esophagus is open and relaxed while inhaling rapidly. Yes, this is inhaling rapidly. Second, the injection method. The patient impounds the air in the oral cavity, pushes it back to the esophagus, and that vibrates the cricofrenchus muscle. So um, the question was asking about method number two, in this case, injection method. Never heard of that before. Yeah, the fun fact is, all the ones you're getting wrong, you're choosing the answers I chose the first time I took the practice tests. So this is just normal. <laughs> <laughs> These are the exact answers I chose. <laughs> all right, question seven. In this approach to counseling, clients need acceptance and positive, unconditional regard to develop congruence between their self concept and behavior. Is this A, the psychodynamic theory? B, client-centered theory, C, behavioral theory, or D, the cognitive behavioral theory? On with D. Right, and C. Let's see. C, the behavioral theory. The key word there, behavior, between their self-concept and behavior. I know, it seems kind of like it's right on the nose, so why would that be the answer but it really is it's right there for you all right blank is a central cognitive principle the principle involves scheme which defines the way humans organize behavior into identifiable patterns is it a equilibrium b imitation c organization or d adaptation so what is the blank line supposed to be c that I'm putting. I'm gonna do that too. C. <laughs> <laughs> and it is C, the key word there being organized behavior. So yes, it is organization. Yay! <laughs> They're not always trying to trick you. <laughs> Mostly yes, but <laughs> <laughs> All right, another fill in the blank. Question nine. Blank is the most cause, common cause of dementia. It is officially diagnosed during blank. All right, so you're going to respond to two different answer choices, right? You have to fill in both. So is it A, Parkinson's, B, Alzheimer's, C, early stages, or D, autopsy? So you need two answers. I'm going to say B and C. Okay. Same. B and then C. You have two cards. Okay. 
You're both right with B, Alzheimer's disease. However, it is not diagnosed until the autopsy. On the test, mm -hmm. you don't get points for both. If, if you have a, a question with two fill in the blanks, you have to get both right for your, your points to count towards that question. Yeah. But we're not Asha. <laughs> no, I was just spewing some information so they knew. <laughs> No, that is, would that have is gotten good. like a, a zero on that, like no points. Yes. Okay. Yes. Actually, would have okay. got minus one. But. <laughs> oh. Sad. Actually, well, I guess on the real test they don't deduct. They just oh, they don't deduct. Don't, don't add. Don't get it counted. Okay. Trivia night, we deduct, but in this case, we got one. Okay. All right. Question ten. After analyzing data from an articulation test. Your data indicates that the child can produce one and two syllable words. However, the child has reduced syllable shapes produced as open syllables and two syllable words. Based on these findings, you conclude that A, the child lacks one and two syllable words. B, the two syllable words were reduced to one syllable words. However, the child produced multisyllabic words such as banana. C, most of the two syllable words were reduced by final consonant deletion. Or D, most of the time, the child maintained the CVC structure. C. C. Sorry. <laughs> the answer is C. Most of the two-syllable words were reduced by final consonant deletion. Way to go, girls. Question number 11. A four-year-old child, Abby, is referred by her pediatrician to a multidisciplinary clinic where speech-language pathologists and audiologists work with a variety of other healthcare professionals. The pediatrician is concerned because Abby has had many middle ear infections and several sets of pressure equalizing tubes. At her preschool, the teacher says that she tunes out and has difficulty following directions. Her mother says that at home, Abby always requests that music and TV be turned up louder. Thus, the pediatrician wants her to have a thorough evaluation of her hearing. If Abby has difficulty with homophonous pairs, she would have trouble distinguishing between words like A, bat, mat, B, trash, cash, C, horn, corn, or D, show, row. I'm going to go A, yeah. A. A. Okay, here we go. So the answer is A, bat, mat. So um, for those who don't know, homophones are words that sound alike, whether or not they're spelled differently. So things like pair and pair and pair, um, <laughs> all different uh, spellings and meanings of the same pronunciation. Um, so... In this case, bat and mat, um, especially for someone with a hearing loss, are made in the same place. So if you're just looking bat, mat, they look the same. They have that um, homophonous pair. So good job, guys. Question number 12. Ellen, a 80-year-old patient, was being seen for swallowing problems. She presents with minimal arousal and is unable to follow simple one-step commands to complete an oral mechanism examination. The clinician initiates ice chip trials as a part of the evaluation and notes oral acceptance and manipulation that is within normal limits. However, no pharyngeal swallow is noted as per palpita palpation. Palpation? The clinician therefore decides to trial exercises that stimulate the swallow reflex and determine Ellen's stimulability for trials. The following exercises are designed to stimulate the swallow reflex, except A, thermal stimulation, B, Mendelssohn maneuver, C, practicing liquid swallow after stimulation, or D, asking the patient to swallow after stimulation without food. I'm gonna say C. Yep, I'm also gonna say C. Okay. The answer is actually B. So um, the Mendelssohn Maneuver is a supraglottic swallow. So that is when you are holding the larynx at its highest possible height to um, increase the duration of the cricopharyngeal opening. So that is the only one of the options that was given that does not involve stimulating. It's an actual physical exercise, um, whereas, or I guess maneuver. <laughs> um, Whereas all the other ones, thermal stimulation, 
um, liquid swallow after stimulation um, all involve some sort of stimulation. <laughs> How many times can you say stimulation in one sentence? <laughs> okay. Might as well add it in there. Right. Uh, question 13. You have been referred an eight-year-old boy because the teacher suspects that he stutters. Before rendering a diagnosis, you wish to determine the different kinds of disfluencies he exhibits. You have taken an extended speech sample, and you are now counting the different forms of disfluency. Select the following statement that is correct in measuring the types and the number of disfluencies in specified utterances. Okay, so take this time to read the answer choices. I'm, we're only going to read the answer. So letter A contains three word repetitions, two interjections, and two syllable prolongations. Letter B contains two sound repetitions and one word repetition. Letter C contains one phrase repetition, two sound prolongations, one sound interjection, and one part word repetition. And letter D contains one word repetition, two pauses, and one sound repetition. I'm going to say C. C. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So the letter choice that is correct is C. Um, so I'm going to read it to you first, and then we'll dissect it. So it's, I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to see what um, my mom was d d d doing. Contains one phrase repetition. So I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to see. So that they're doing a phrase repetition. It's not the amount of times that it's repeated. Otherwise I would be like one, two, three. But it's how many times did it happen? So it happened once that the phrase was repeated. Two sound prolongations, which are C and mom. Um, one sound interjection, which is like, um, uh, so like things like that are <laughs> sound interjections. And uh, one part word or sound repetition is for d, 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 doing. So it's part of the word doing or part, a individual sound that is being repeated, not necessarily a word or a phrase um so yeah the answer is c question 14 a three-year-old boy with autism comes to you for intervention his parents would like for him to interact more successfully with his siblings and peers he needs work in many areas but the ability to establish joint reference is critical for him now which of these activities would you begin with a labeling objects with one word descriptors B, using is and verb ing in sentences. C, paying attention to the same object or activity as you when directed to do so. Or D, working on narrative skills. I'm going to say C. E. Nailed it. Um, C, paying attention to the same object or activity as you do when directed so, which is also known as joint attention, which is something that is very important for language acquisition, and it is particularly difficult for kids on the spectrum. Um, so uh, things that could improve specific skills to joint attention could be pointing to the same object, showing them something, um, and coordinating looks between a person and an object. Um, sometimes that could literally mean bringing something close to your face so that they're looking at you and the object, um, all important in getting them to um, associate that language with the attention skills that they're lacking. Okay. Okay, question 15. A 48-year-old patient who had a tracheostomy tube in place was referred for an evaluation. The speech language pathologist noted that the tube was cuffed and quizzed her student intern about the differences between cuffed and uncuffed tracheostomy tubes. The student replied that an inflated, inflated tube is A, may restrict laryngeal elevation, B, will not restrict laryngeal elevation, C, will not inhibit a patient relearning to swallow, or D, will not place pressure on the esophagus via the common posterior wall between the esophagus and the trachea. I'm going to say C. A. Yep. C. Okay. For this next one, we have a graph because I feel like traits are really hard to understand unless you can see it. 
Um, so if you look here, this is where our lovely trach is. Um, when it is cuffed, it actually can anchor down the larynx. So it'll affect laryngeal elevation, as well as epiglottic inversion and airway protection. Um, cuff trach tube, secure the larynx, deflated cuff is more free. Um, another reason why we like to um, uncuff a trach when we're feeding a patient is um, so that they have some airway protection. If something goes the wrong way, you want them to be able to cough and get it out. And they can't do that with a cuff trach. So um, really, cuff trachs cause a lot of complications when you're feeding. Uncuff it. <laughs> Question 16. Which of the following results from injury to the structure is responsible for reading and is demonstrated in individuals as a difficulty with perceiving and comprehending written language? A, traumatic brain injury, B, alexia, C, dysarthria, or D, apraxia? I'm going to say A. Um, um, I'm going to say B. Right. I want to say B too. It's too late. <laughs> no, no, you could change. You could change. You want to change? Okay, because I'm like rereading the question. I'm like, what's the fine results from injury to this? Okay, so I, okay, I think I want to say B too. See, but that's good. And the real test, you have time to change your answer. You can always mark for later. <laughs> that is a good skill. Reread the questions after you answer them. It's because the answer was B, Alexia. So good job. So if we look at our darling Latin roots. Um, a, before as a prefix, typically means not. And lexia is something uh, always pertaining to reading or something that is readable. So, you know, um, when we talk about our mental dictionaries, our lexicon, it's like always has to do with words. So um, the key words in this question were difficulty, perceiving, comprehending, reading, and written language. So we have difficulty with and reading and words. Question 17. You are testing a child whose primary language is not English. You use the services of an interpreter. To facilitate accurate interpreting, all of the following are appropriate except A, speaking in short units with frequent pauses, B, encouraging the interpreter to interpret the client's words and meaning, C, providing the interpreter with the opportunity to ask for clarification when needed, or D, looking at the interpreter rather than the client when speaking? D. Yeah. D. My, my only explanation for this one was just rude. Like, it's not nice. It's just not nice. True. You're talking to your client. You talk to your client. Whether or not they need the interpreter. Client-centered approach, my friends. Okay. Oh. Question 18. <laughs> Blank frequencies are resonated with greater amplitude than blank, than blank frequencies. A, distorted, lower. B, higher, lower. C, lower, higher. Or D, attenuated and impedance-free. B, sorry, I keep saying, I'm not saying it. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. The answer was B, another graph to show you how this works. Um, yeah, so I just want to put the whole sentence together. Higher frequencies are resonated with a greater amplitude than lower frequencies. So um, if you take a look, high frequencies, you know, are just like, just bigger. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're more closely together. They're higher amplified. Um, whereas lower pitches kind of travel slowly, lower peaks. Um, Question 19. Impaired facial recognition is more common in patients A, anterior right hemisphere damage, B, posterior right hemisphere damage, C, tem left temporal lobe damage, or D, damage to the perisylvian region? I'm going to say B, posterior right. <laughs> I'm say A, anterior right. I don't know. Oh, my God. Right. was B, but you were both right that it was the right hemisphere. Yeah. And that, I feel like... That was a toss-up. <laughs> that was that, it's really hard. When I took it, I actually said A too. Um, but yeah, so the posterior right hemisphere, um, 
is responsible for facial recognition, but the whole right hemisphere, for those of you who needed a refresher, responsible for spatial reasoning. It's our more artistic side. We got music. Um, whereas the left side would have been language, which is really more our bread and butter, right? Question 20. Clients with a cleft palate will almost universally have issues related to which of the following? A, persistent otitis media leading to conducted hearing loss. B, anatomical deformities causing sensory neural hearing loss. C, otitis media leading to sensory neural hearing loss. Or D, congenital conductive hearing loss. I'm going to say B. Thank you. I'm also going to say B. All right. It's actually A. <laughs> persistent, <laughs> um, persistent otitis media, which leads to conductive hearing losses. So with children with a cleft palate, there is a normal position of their muscles and the tendons. So the eustachian tube isn't draining as well as average children of their normal age. So fluid collects in the air, higher risk of middle ear infections. They miss more language. It's another reason why they're here. They're not just our tick kids. Um, sometimes it's a language delay as well. Okay. Interesting. RV, uh, not RV, Yadi. You were keeping score? I was keeping score. So, Andre, Drum roll. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so Audra completed this Praxis Trivia Night with a total of 11 points. Yeah. Shout out to Audra. She got 11 points. She's killing it. And Jess completed this Praxis Trivia Night with a total of 15 points. So awesome. You guys haven't taken a lot of these classes. <laughs> yeah. The audiology, I, d I haven't taken any audiology classes, so that was really difficult, too, so. Yeah. Um, and and props to both of you for not passing on a single question. You knew there were courses you didn't take, and you still said, I'll take a shot at it. And that, I, honestly, I was really just, like, super proud of you guys. Like, that's really difficult to do sometimes, to just give it a shot. And I was really proud. So that was really great, you guys. Yeah, and on the um, team, don't pass on a question. You yes. answer everything. Right. Okay. Yes, how, how did you think you did? Like, how did you feel? Um, it was harder than I thought, I guess I could say. But it also was more common sense. I feel like I overthought a few of them that, like, especially in the beginning ones, I was overthinking them. And I think, like, when in doubt in the future, and especially when I start studying, I know to, like, just go with my gut and go with what makes sense because most of the time I feel like that's the answer. So, Yeah, I agree with Jess. I also, like, appreciate just even reading, like, the format of the question because, like, um, I forgot who mentioned it. Like, almost, like, reading the question and going back to the, like, beat of the whole paragraph was helping me come – like across like the right answers and definitely with stuff I knew that I took the class before versus stuff I haven't taken, but it definitely helps like using the context clues. Definitely. But thank you guys for the opportunity because I feel like just the exposure to even 20 questions is going to help us so much like in the future and who knows, maybe when we take it, it'll come up like. On the <laughs> yeah. Let's do another I one. Later. <laughs> oh, let's do it again. <laughs> Practice trivia night part two coming soon. <laughs> coming soon. No, comment below if you want it. another. <laughs> no, I, I have to do my daily comment below. Yeah, right? yeah, but so for the two of you, thank you for participating so much. Um, it, it takes a lot of guts to come on here, especially when um, you know you haven't completed all of your coursework. You haven't even signed up for the practice yet you were willing to come and be our contestants and it meant a lot to us so um both of you are going to receive a five dollar gift card to the place of your choice we will let you pick and it's on us you want a coffee on us starbucks duncan you need resources tpt teachers pay teachers amazon you got it Aww. thank you for coming on this show <laughs> nah, thank you for having us this is fun thank you so much we're well, glad you guys enjoyed and we hope that you feel that this was helpful and beneficial and that you've been enjoying the show so far or the podcast ah, yes. <laughs> we love slps in a podcast <laughs> thanks guys awesome.
Thanks, guys. So tune in to our next podcast episode, episode five. We have Brooke Renee. She is a medical speech language pathologist, an avid lifter, and a clinical fellow supervisor. She currently works at in an acute care outpatient inpatient rehab and skilled nursing facility in the Kansas City area. She is passionate about EDP, providing support for new grads and SLPs wanting to transition to the medical field and loves sharing educational content on social media. Thanks for watching, everyone. Please follow us on SoundCloud on SLPs and a pod on YouTube or SLPs and a podcast. And then follow our Instagram accounts, SLPs and a podcast to see the whole pod. We've got Arva T SLP, Gracie Z SLP, and Yuritza SLP. So um, thank you guys. And a big thank you again to Jess and Audra for coming on tonight. Thank you guys so much for watching. And we'll see you at the next episode. Woo! Bye. Bye, Bye everyone.